If you are new here, let me say welcome. We're glad that you're here. We've been in a series called uh, One Life. We talk about walking and um, uh, allowing the uh, Christ to live through us, the Spirit to live through us. Uh, we have this thing that we, we uh, quote. It's scripture. Maybe it applies to you. Hopefully it does. But it's, it's Galatians 2.20. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And we're focusing on that. What does that mean? What does it mean to have Christ's life living through you? We want to talk about that today and how that looks specifically for ourselves. Father in heaven, I pray, as we enter into your word, God, I pray, prepare our hearts and our minds. Lord, your word says that you will renew our minds by your word, transform us today, not just as we read, but Holy Spirit, I pray you would unpack the truth and unpack the calling that you have for our life. Show us, Lord, how we are to think, seeing how, Father, we have your life inside of us. We ask that you would transform our mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If we do share in this one life, I don't know how many of y'all have been having to pop your bracelet, you know, and, and remind yourself, okay, die, die today. Can I tell you today, I was, I was just like this. I was like this because I was walking through the youth room, and the lights were off, and I caught my shin on that chair, bless the Lord. I'm telling you, I know I'm safe now. I know I'm safe now. I know I'm safe. If I ever doubted it, that moment I knew, because I bent over, and I grabbed that chair, and I said, Lord, I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'm d I don't know about you. Can I, let me just sympathetically, if there are anybody, is anybody in the house that when you get hurt, something monstrous awakes, awakes in you. Is there anybody like that? That literally I thought, you know what, I will tear this church down. You know what I mean? Like in a heartbeat. Maybe not all of y'all that. I know me and Madeline, we're that way. If, if we get hurt, there's a beast inside of us. And then slowly my skin turns from green back to normal color again. But uh, it hurts, buddy. It hurts. I thank God because of that moment. <laughs> I, the Lord preached to me in my sermon in that 20 seconds of pain. What would the mind of Christ do right now, Scott? My like, Lord Jesus, I'm hurt. I'm in pain. I was in pain too. You know what I mean? Like, so I love when the Lord just comes for me, just for me. And, and I, wanted, I want to be more like him. Today, we want to focus on that. If Christ's life really is inside of us, then it makes sense that we would have his mind too, Right? It's not just that we have this life that frees us from uh, condemnation, but really that there's more of a transforming effect, and that is that you and I have the capacity to think as Christ thought, to have the mind of Christ. In fact, I'm going to kind of just do a mini-series. We've been in this series called One Life, and I'm going to finish this series out in a mini-series on the mind of Christ. Because I think it's so important for us to understand what the mind of Christ truly is. You and I live in a world that does not embrace the mind of Christ. If we, in fact, have the mind of Christ um, because we have his life in us, then doesn't it make sense that you and I would think like he thought and for us to know what he thinks, it should be contradictory to the world, right? And so today is the first thing we're going to tackle, but I want to just give you uh, a heads up, if you wanted to study ahead of me, you can, but today we're going to be talking about the mind of Christ defers to the Father's will. That's the first thing we need to know. The mind of Christ defers to the Father's will, but the world pursues self-interest. That's what the world does. We're going to talk about that today. In the coming weeks, we'll talk about how the mind of Christ depends on the Father but the world celebrates self-sufficiency, and that the mind of Christ displays humility before the Father, but the world exalts pride, amen, and self-glorification. And so we should have a mindset that says we are not of this world. And when you observe our life, our life, because if his mind is in me, because his spirit's in me, his life is in me, then I should observe the same thing in you, right? That means I have the ability to call things out, right? So if I don't see Mike 
deferring to the Father's will. I'm going to call you out, Mike. Is that good? Mike said, I'm gay. And, and Mike, you called me out too. You said, Pastor Scott, I know, I know what happened when you hit that chair, all right? So, but don't act in self-interest. So we want to do that. Read with me in chapter, uh, Philippians chapter 2, as we look in or kind of glimpse into where Paul addresses the mind of Christ. He, he really gives us a great little passage here for us to engage and ask ourselves, is, is this what's happening? And, and Paul writes so deeply. He starts off in verse 1. We'll go through 8. He starts off in verse 1. He actually kind of gives a list of rhetorical statements uh, that all really end in yes to bring us to a conclusion. It goes like this. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, then uh, any participation in the Spirit, any affection uh, and sympathy, complete my joy. So if we have any encouragement, any comfort, any love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, and being in full accord and of one mind. So if we have received any of those things, those things are true, the answer is yes, then we ought to be in full accord and of one mind. And so he goes on and says, okay, so if that's true, here's the condition. Here's what you're supposed to do. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And having this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Remember how we got into Christ Jesus? God the Father put us into Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The mind of Christ, the mind of Christ defers. Defer means to, re, to humbly submit. He humbly submits himself to the Father's will. That's a huge statement. I don't know. Can you say that and feel not guilty? Can you say, Pastor Scott, I know when I say before God, I defer, I humbly submit my will to the Father's will. That's a difficult thing because we know there's parts of our will that are probably most likely not submitted. We know that probably in gist or the, the major parts of our life is, is submitted, but, but it's, there's some things that we're still working on, that we need God's grace. We know that um, Jesus submitted his will. The first act of submission was the uh, incarnation. He came. He was here. We know that he came because God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only, one, his only son. And so, so since he came, he's here out of the love from the Father, but, but Jesus didn't just come because he was a gift of love from the Father. He was also an obedient son. Look at John 6, 38. It says, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Uh, John 5.30 says this, How can, I can do nothing on my own as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And John 8.42 says, Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. So consistently we see that Jesus deferred, right, to the Father who sent him. Jesus says, I came from God, and I am here. But what if Jesus just stopped there? He stopped at the moment that says, I came from God, and I am here. What if all we got from Jesus was a, I am here, and that was it? I feel like, church, that Christianity that we know uh, is simply okay with Jesus being here. And we stop there. Jesus is here. Let's go on with our life. We take him places that he should not be okay with, right? We make him watch things that we shouldn't be doing. We make him see things that we shouldn't be watching. We cause him to hear things that we shouldn't be saying. We hear things that we shouldn't be hearing. We are totally okay with Jesus saying, I'm here. It's really the cross that bothers us. But the fact that Jesus is here is something we're okay. If I'm being honest, 
I think most of Christianity likes the idea that Jesus is okay with the participation trophy. He came, he showed up, he's here. Good job, you made it. I'm here, I, I don't know what else I can do for you. But can I tell you that Jesus longs for more than a participation trophy. He longs to climb the platform to the top, sit upon the throne, put a crown on his head, and reign as first place in your life. Jesus wants to be more than just here. Because let's be honest, let's be real. We need a Jesus who will be more than just say, I'm here. When our families are in the hospitals, right, and they're fighting sickness, we need a Jesus who says more than just, I'm here. When our marriage is close to calling it quits, when our job is telling us we have two weeks left, when our kids turn wayward and they abandon the truth and the love that we've taught them, we need a Christ that says more than just, I'm here. We need a Jesus who simply wants uh, to do more than participate. I need a Jesus who will dominate. That's what I need to do. I need a Jesus who will dominate my world, dominate my culture, dominate my city, dominate my church, dominate my family, and most importantly, dominate myself. That's the kind of Jesus that I need. And so, church, if Jesus, if, 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 we, if we don't want a Jesus who says, I'm here, do you think Jesus wants a bride that just says, I'm here? Do you think Jesus just wants a church that says, I'm here? Do you think Jesus just wants a disciple that says, I'm here let me have my spiritual participation trophy. Do you know I love y'all? And every Sunday I get to come in here and just beat y'all over the head with this word, right? Now some of y'all are like, I love Pastor Scott. He just, he just makes me feel so good about myself when I leave here. But you know, to be honest, I, I, I just don't have, any, I don't have any room in my life for Jesus who cannot dominate every aspect of my life. I have some real issues. I have some real past. I have some real problems. I have some real needs. I have a real job with a real family, with real friends. And all of those things need Jesus to be more than participatory. I need him to dominate every one of those things in life. So that way, in every aspect, the enemy tries to come in and steal, kill, and destroy. He says, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not here to participate. I'm here to dominate. And so I need his word to crack me open and say, right there is where he's going to come for you, Scott. Right there is how he's going to exploit you and expose you. But if you'll give that to me, I'll do more than just participate. I'll do more than just say, I'm here. Jesus, like Jesus, we need to have a mind of Christ that that completely submits to the Father's will. In fact, this is what Jesus did. Paul tells us in Philippians 2.8. He goes, and being found in human form. he, He didn't just stop there. It says he humbled himself. How did he humble himself? By becoming obedient. I want you just to soak that in for a second. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. If you really want to know if you have the mind of Christ, your obedience should require humility. Your obedience should require humility. Obedience requires the surrendering of your will, and that takes humility. So what does humility look like? Well, Paul tells us in verse 3. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, right? Don't. Don't, don't be about your business, right? Don't, don't seek your truth. Don't, don't do you. Let's talk about it for a second. But in humility, you know what humility means? But in humility, but in, you got to come up off that pedestal, right? Oh, this is the Lord's spot. Let me go ahead and step down. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. I don't know about you, but I know your flesh is talking to me right now. I don't, I, I don't know one person that says, oh, that's me. I can't wait to count other people more significant than myself. That's why you need the mind of Christ, because it's not in you to love other people the way they, they don't deserve. The way they don't deserve. 
But that's what we're called to with this mind of Christ, with this life that's living in us. So let me leave you with this question. We'll return back to this later on. What do you think it looks like to count others greater than yourself? If I was to follow you around and go home with you, watch you talk to your wife, watch you talk to your kids, watch you talk to your employer, watch you talk to your employees, watch you talk to that person at Walmart checking you out. Oh, they don't check out there. <laughs> uh, wherever you go to check out, I forgot. Talk to the machine, I guess. I don't know. But as I, if I follow you around everywhere, what does that look like in your life to count others more significant than yourself? Because that's an important question for us to entertain. And I want us to see first, before we get to that question, what I want us to see first is the result of humbling, humbling ourselves, which is what we see in Jesus, and that is obedience. So what is obedience? Obedience is the tool by which we measure submission. Obedience is the tool by which we measure submission, which we measure how much we've deferred to the Father for his will. Now, if submission is too hard of a word for you because you say, oh, Pastor Scott, when I hear the word submission, what I hear is you're going to strip away my freedom. Well, you know what? That's just the culture implanting those definitions upon you because that's not how we find submission in the Word of God. And just to remind you, we follow one book. And so whatever the book says, whatever the Word says, that is the definition in which we follow. And so here's what we see about submission. Submission is an act of love. It's an act of love. That's why it's difficult for us to understand, in fact, most times when I talk to wives, they're like, I can't submit to him because we don't rightly know what love looks like. But Jesus defines that for us. In John 10, 17 through 18, he says this, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. Pay attention here. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. And so this charge, this, this right, this permission, or another word for the word charge is a warrant, the ability to go and serve notice with authority. This charge I have received from my Father. So Jesus says, my submission is my choice. I'm willing to obey because it's an act of love. It's not a lack of authority. Sometimes we feel like submission is because I have no, I'm helpless. I can't do anything. I have to. I'm obligated. I have to. No. Jesus said that's not the case. It says, he says, he addresses it by addressing the authority that he has. He says, I have authority. I have exousia. That means I have control over. I have a freedom of choice to lay it down and to pick it up again. In fact, if we look at the context of uh, John um, chapter 10, what we see is this is all about the shepherd, the good shepherd, who lays down his life for the sheep. So the, so the whole essence of what he's talking about is someone, God specifically, is a good shepherd who loves. And so love is, is the theme. He's saying that I submit to my Father's will because I'm driven by love. Love is the catalyst. Later, Jesus says in John 15, 9 through 10, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love, and if you keep, or keep as embrace, observe, or submit to my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept or did the same thing that I'm asking you to do, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Did you know when I was searching for how Jesus loves us, I did not find where it says, Jesus loved me and you as in the world. Now, there are full of actions, but I never heard him say, I love the world, or I love you dirty people. You know what I mean? Or, I love you people who need redeem, redemption. He never did that. Jesus, Jesus demonstrated his love for the Father, and he even loved the disciples because the disciples were given to him by the Father. Here's what I say. Does Jesus love us? Yes. Uh, maybe sometimes, like some of us in here, we don't say the words, I love you, but we mean it, right? And we know that Jesus does love us. But what I want you to see is that Jesus did everything he was asked to do, not because he loved us, but because he loved the Father. 
Father loves you. The Father loves you. The Father loves you that he gave his son to come into the world and die for us. Jesus gave his life. He offered his life because he loved the Father and he knew that if the Father loved us so much and the way for you and I to become one again with the Father was for the Son to die, Jesus says, I'll do it because I love the Father that much and the Father loves you that much. There is a submission and there is always a love and a righteous submission. So I can just pause for a second today and just ask you, how much do you really love God? Because obedience is the measure of our submission. Are we really walking out this obedience with him? Are we really walking out this love? Do we, we say we love him. We know he loves us. But, but does it really look like that? Obedience is a difficult thing to acquire, to be honest. It's not an easy thing. It, it's one thing to do one act, but to be consistent, to be committed to, to walk through it thoroughly, that takes some real devotion. And it takes some real suffering. And even though Jesus deferred to the will of God completely, there was a process he had to take in becoming obedient. Now notice that Jesus had to become obedient. Having the mind of Christ doesn't mean you automatically know what obedience is. That's a difficult thing for us to understand. But it is a process. Notice what Paul says of Jesus. He humbled himself by what? Becoming obedient. We just think, man, Jesus came down out of the chute and he was just obedient here, obedient here. Let me just say this. Jesus was never disobedient, but obedience is a process. Obedience is something we must learn. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. Hebrews is writing here and he's talking about Jesus being the high priest. Um, That's significant because he's letting us know that as the high priest... who who intercedes for us for eternity, he's letting us know he's not not some priest that doesn't know what you're going through. He knows what you're going through. That's what makes him so effective as a priest that he was tempted in all points, tried in all points, suffered in all points like you. And so when he intercedes to the Father on our behalf, he knows exactly what to pray. It's not just that he's omniscient. But he, he, his obedience was perfected through suffering. It says in verse 7, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications. This is the uh, Garden of Gethsemane moment. We'll read this later on. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. In fact, when you I look this up, loud cries and tears is exactly what you think. Jesus was crying out at the top of his voice for the Father to save him. And he was heard because of his reverence. That's interesting. I wish we could study that. But he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he what? He learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, that's important for me personally because I need to know if Jesus is having to learn obedience I have to learn obedience. It's not something I should just be expected to walk in. Your obedience and your relationship with Christ is something that you are learning. Now, Jesus is learning obedience, but it was never because of something he was, he was never disobedient. So what does that mean to to learn obedience? Well, we see right here that he, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Can I tell you that obedience is learned through suffering? And all the flesh said, amen, hallelujah. So so I hear what you're saying right now. You're not voicing it out, but what you're saying is, so Pastor Scott, I should never pray for obedience because that's inviting suffering. Yes. It does invite suffering. In fact, if I could just stretch you a little bit, I'm not talking to you about what you should do. Today I'm talking about who you are. You are a servant, a son, and a daughter of the king. And if it is his will that you suffer, then you do him great glory in doing so. 
question is, is are you obedient enough to know that suffering is waiting for you? And can you walk through it with a grateful heart, knowing that whatever difficulty you walk through will bring in praise? Is that where you are? Because that's where we need to be. That's who we are. We are sons and daughters of the king, but we are also servants of the king. And whatever he bid ask us to do, that we will do. Because we owe everything to him. Apart from him, apart from his life, apart from his grace, there's nothing but death. There's nothing but judgment. There's nothing but disobedience, right? And so for us, we have to learn and understand that our life is not our own. If we, without lying, we cannot say that, that it is Christ in me who lives, right? That the life I live, I, I live in the flesh, but, but I live by Christ who lives in me. We can't say we've been crucified with Christ if we do not give him all aspects of our life. So what's, what are you holding out on? What are the things that you said, ah, Lord, I don't know how to trust you yet? Because really that's what a matter of obedience is, right? Obedience submission has to do with trust. If you cannot obey, if you cannot submit, the real issue you have is that you don't trust. And if you don't trust, it's because you don't know who you're trusting. If you know who you're trusting, then trusting is easy. It comes out very, very easily, right? It's effortlessly. I, don't, I, 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 I trust Julie. I don't even have to ask questions. If she makes a decision, it's okay with me. I know who she is. I know who she is. And I know her will towards me. I know she would never do anything that would bring me harm that wasn't for my good. She may put me in some places in life, but I know at the end that her heart is good towards me. You should know that your Father in heaven that his desire towards you is good. His heart is good. He is a good, good father. And so we can trust him. And so since we can trust him, we can honor him with our love by obeying, even though we don't understand it. And so if suffering is required for our life, are you, are you okay with it? If enduring is okay. Matter of fact, Romans 5, 3 says, um, uh, and what is it? The first word, the first word. Hold on here. Um, no, it's not faith. He says basically that, that suffering is great because it brings about endurance. Endurance is great because it brings about character. And character is great because it brings about hope. And we have this great hope because God has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. I think that's exactly what it says. So what I want you to know is simply this, is that suffering is a tremendous part of the path, of the path and the process to get you to the place that your hope is elevated so you can realize the love of God in your life. We just don't like that path because suffering brings endurance, but you don't get endurance unless you go through suffering. Whoever has encountered endurance without going through suffering? Some of y'all have suffered well in your homes, and now you have endurance. Some of you might suffer well at your job, and God is working in you. God is working in you. You said, Lord, that boss has got to go. That coworker has got to close there. Lord, I rebuke the mouth of the devourer. But you didn't know that that suffering was, was working in you endurance so that your endurance could produce a character that would honor God and that character would produce a hope so you could see and realize the love of God not just being poured into you but being poured through you. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm through sidetracking there, but I'm telling you, Learn to suffer. Learn to pray for that. I know some of y'all think I lost my mind. Pastor Scott told me to ask, ask the Lord to let me suffer. Yes. Yes. Obedience is learned through suffering. Obedience for Jesus was learned. That is, it's realized or it came about through experience rather than through instruction. Now, some of us would say, and, and I don't know about you, but I, I grew up in the church that would tell me that that. That suffering is God's way of teaching you, Scott, when you fail to learn through his word. 
That's why you're suffering, because you didn't learn through his word. Well, no, that's not exactly true. We're not talking about that type of suffering. There's two different types of suffering. There is a righteous suffering and a repercussive suffering. Repercussive suffering is when we make mistakes and we deal with the repercussion of our actions. Those are consequences. The book of Judges is full of that stuff, full of those things. The book of Judges says the people abandoned the Lord, and then he sold them into the hand of the enemy, and they plundered their lifestyles by robbing them of the lifestyles that only God gives, and over, and then God would save them, and then they'd go right back to being dumb again, and God would punish them again because their suffering was, was due them because they abandoned God, and over and over and over and over again. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about righteous suffering because Jesus didn't make any mistakes right? He was perfect. Jesus' suffering is a righteous suffering. It's the suffering that one faces when we embrace the values from the kingdom of heaven while living here on earth. There is a suffering that you and I will go through simply because we are not of this world. We don't adhere to the policies, the practices, right, and and the principles of this earth. We are not of this world. We belong to a kingdom greater than this world, a kingdom that one day will make this world submit to the kingdom of heaven. But right now, you and I as ambassadors, as we represent the kingdom of heaven, you and I are in conflict with the world. They do not agree with what we do. They say you're foolish to turn your cheek when someone slaps one side. They say you're, it's foolish if you're trying to be great to be less than. They say it's foolish that when you're, when you're needy, when you're broke, is to give your way out. Those are crazy things. Yes, because the kingdom principles are upside-down principles that we live in. And so we find suffering when we embrace the values of the kingdom of heaven in this world. That's the three Hebrew children that said, no, you need to serve this God. You need to bow down this idol. And the Hebrew children said, no. We don't live by your rules. We live by the rule. His name is Jehovah. That's who we follow. That is the word that we follow. When they told Daniel, you can't pray no more, he says, no, you don't get to tell me what to do. I'm going to continue to praise God and pray to God because that's what he has called me to do. I don't live by these low-level demands. And one day, church... It might be that you and I will come face to face with the principles of this world and they will demand us to do something. I don't know if it will be bow down to some idol or to stop praying, but you're going to be faced with a challenge. And the question will simply be this, do you love God? Because if you love God, you'll submit to him and obey his word in the face of the suffering you might be up against as we continue to live in this world. And I want to know, I hope you're ready to say, you know what, I'm not going to do that. It may cost me my job. It may cost me my, my, my welfare of my life. It may cost me my freedom. It may cost me anything. But that's okay because it's just temporary. There'll be a day I will live forevermore. Amen. But as of right now, thank God for the moment that I had that I'm about to endure suffering because this is a moment that I can lift up the name of Jesus. Jesus said, If you don't suffer with me, then you can't share in my glory. So you can give into this world now and give and receive what the glory of of what the world has for you. Or you can deny that and embrace the suffering, the righteous suffering that Christ has for you and share with his glory forever. The second way we we encounter righteous suffering is through uh, serving others when they don't deserve us serving them. (laughs) When we serve others while they live to serve themselves is a difficult thing. That kind of suffering comes from obeying out of love. That is the mind of Christ, the mind that defers to the will of the Father, the mind that Paul says we are to have, a mind that says in Philippians 2.3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant Then yourselves, I asked you earlier, what did it mean to count others more significant than yourselves? It's this. You ready? I didn't put it on the screen, but write it down and etch it into your heart. It's to love others 
in such a way that the cost to do so is righteous suffering. Love others in such a way that the cost to do so is a righteous suffering. Because if we don't love that way, then you're loving based off what fits you, what suits you. Jesus says, what good is that, that you love people who love you back? But this is how you know you truly love as the Father loves, as the Son loves, when you love people at the cost of suffering righteousness. That's how we count others more significant than ourselves. Is that what Jesus did? Did he live in such a way that counted others more significant than himself? The cross would say yes. As the worship team comes back up, I want to close by looking at this last passage of Jesus' obedience. Matthew 26, 36 through 42. Jesus is in the garden. You know the story. He's about to, he's about to go up on the cross, and he is talking with the Father. He's vexed. He, he's in some agony. His soul is troublesome. Read with me in verse 36. He says, then Jesus went with him to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. I want you to remember, as I read this, I remind you that it wasn't Jesus' will to die for you. Jesus did not want to die for you. Now, is it, was it because you weren't worthy? No. It's because the cost. The price was more significant than our worth. Let me say that again. Jesus didn't want to die because he knew the cost was greater than our worth. The cost was that he would be separated from the Father. The cost was that he would take on the sins of the world, would be placed upon his shoulders, and that separation that he had never in eternity past ever had he was finally, he was at a place where the Father and the Son could not be in relationship because there was sin, and God the Father is holy. He cannot just permit unrighteousness. He cannot just permit sin and be okay. I know sometimes we think that's possible. I know sometimes I've heard preachers preach that to be possible. But can I tell you that God is a holy, just God, and he does not allow sin, even when it's upon his Son, to be in his presence. That's why Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God did something with his son so that he would never have to do that with you. Forsake you. Never forsake you. Never forsake you. Never leave you. Never abandon you. Jesus paid that price because he loved his father. He paid the price because his father loved us. That's what's so great about his cross is that he fulfilled the father's will. That's what he's asking us to do today. Each one of us have a cross. Each one of us have something that we need to do. We may not understand what us being on our cross means to somebody else, but it makes no difference because we're not doing what we're doing because of somebody else that needs it. We're obeying the Father because He deserves it. Jesus understood that. And if we have the mind of Christ, we should walk in that way too. I want you to see that the process of Jesus becoming obedient was through the righteous suffering He faced by counting you more significant than himself. The process, of, the process of us becoming obedient will be through the righteous suffering we incur 
by counting others more significant than ourselves. I become more obedient by the righteous suffering I endure by counting you to be more significant than me. You become more obedient by the righteous suffering of counting other people in this room or those who are coming into this room or those who need to be in this room to be more significant than yourself. And if that feels offensive at all, it's because your flesh knows that there's a cross that's waiting for it. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. So here's my questions. What's the cross of your life? What's the thing that your flesh does not want? But it demonstrates your submission. It demonstrates your love to the Father, even if it's suffering. What is it that says that you're counting others more significant than yourself? Because this is the mind of Christ. And we cannot be called Christians apart from the crucified life. If we are to follow Christ, that's what Christian means, a follower of Christ. If we are to follow Christ, then we must embrace the crucified life. We're not okay with Jesus just showing up saying, I'm here. And neither is Jesus okay with a bride that just says, hey, I made it to the show. Just be glad I'm here. Just be glad I made it. No. He wants to dominate in our life because he wants to dominate through our life. The great thing is that he's come to give us life and life more abundant in the process of it all. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to ask you specifically this morning, you may not know the love of the Father. You may not know the sacrifice of the Son. But I am most sure you know the draw of the Holy Spirit this morning. He's called you to surrender, to lay down your will and pick up the Father's will. Because the Father loves you. And the Son confirmed that. And the reason why you can hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you right now is because there is a Father's love for you. And if you're not walking in a relationship with Him, but you want to do so today, if you slip your hand up and just say, Pastor Scott, I'm ready to receive the love of the Father today. I want to walk. I want to walk with Him. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? Would you stand with me today? We all have that cross. Church, if I could just, oh, if I could challenge you. If I could so challenge you. If I could rivet your heart with this question. Where did you jump off the cross? Where did you not surrender? What part of your will are you holding on to? What is it that you need to release back to God again for his glory? And that you would receive his love. Today, I I just want to ask you one thing is, where is your will at in submission to the Father? I want us to be a church that loves people, that welcomes people, that knows the love of the Father, that, it, that, that gives the love of the Father. But I really want us to be a people whose will is submitted to the Father's will. It's a call to obedience. But ob- obedience is the measuring tool of submission. I'm going to pray because I know I need it. We got about three minutes. If you're watching the clock, for God knows whatever reason why, I'm asking you to join me on this journey of becoming more obedient to his will and surrendering yours. Turn at your seat. Join me at the altar. And I invite you to come.